So she just called in, she's dialing in now. Oh, good. Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics in partnership with the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. Living in a landscape where disinformation is running rampant, we'll be having the necessary and urgent conversation about disinformation's consequences nationally and globally. My name is Tareen Ahuja, a first year studying government, philosophy, and ethnicity migration and rights from Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC, but I was born in the University of Chicago Hospital. I serve as the IOP chair of the Civics Program, the director of outreach for South Asian Americans in public service, and a representative on the Harvard College's undergraduate council. Civics places undergraduates in fifth grade classrooms to teach students about the role they can take in community action. And one of the primary things that we focus on is interpreting information. The conversation we are about to embark on today is more important now than ever for every single one of us as we rebuild institutions and rebuild our democracy to be accessible and inclusive of all. With media trust globally dropping by 8%, combating disinformation is at the center of our way forward as a country and world. Welcome everyone. My name is Lucy Ritzman and I'm a senior at the University of Chicago majoring in law letters and society and currently working on a BA thesis about free speech from the Abrams descent to section 230. I'm zooming in today from Hyde Park. This year I have the honor of serving as co-chair of the Student Advisory Board at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. As student leaders, it's our responsibility to serve as liaisons between the IOP staff and the U Chicago student body as well as our greater Chicago community. We do that by listening to our peers, by working to develop programming that meets their interests and their needs, and by fostering and building community. In, this, in these isolating times, that latter task has been more important to us than ever. And a lot of our community building work has had to take place in the virtual space. Even within our campus community, as co-chair, I have seen how social media and the virtual world is forever changing our communication. And while some of that change is positive, there's a lot that's really concerning. For that reason, I'm really honored to be introducing this panel today of experts on how disinformation on social media is affecting our democracy. Especially following the January 6th insurrection at the United States Capitol, we've all experienced a lot of fear and uncertainty on this issue. These are the voices that have kept us informed and educated and even sane. It is undoubtedly through their wisdom and inspiring work that we will find ways to protect our democracy and to move forward into this new digital age. It is our most profound honor to present today's guests, trailblazers in addressing disinformation and democracy building. Dr. Joan Donovan is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Dr. Donovan leads the Technology and Social Change Project. This project explores how media manipulation is a means to control public conversation, derail democracy, and disrupt society. Kara Swisher is the editor-at-large of New York Media, the host of the Pivot podcast and executive producer of the Code Conference. She is also the host of the Sway podcast, a contributing writer to the New York Times opinion section, and appears weekly on CNBC. Swisher was also the host of the Recode Decode podcast for five years, co-founded Recode and Code re owner Revere Digital, and before that, co-produced and co-hosted the Wall Street Journal's, Journal's D All Things Digital with Walt Mossberg. Mr. Roger McNamee is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, which documents his journey from mentor to Mark Zuckerberg to a critic of Facebook. Zucked was the cover story in Time on January 28, 2019. Since April 2017, he has been engaged with many others in a campaign to address the dark side of social media and reform the tech industry. And moderating today's conversation will be Nancy Gibbs, the director of the Shorenstein Center and visiting Edward R. Moreau, professor of practice of press, politics and public policy. Until September 2017, she was the editor in chief of Time, directing news and feature coverage across all platforms for than 65 million readers worldwide and editor editorial director of Time Inc. News Group. Gives is the name Time's 17th editor in September 2013, the first woman to hold that position and remains an editor at large today. We hope you enjoy this conversation and take away an understanding of why it is on all of us to pay attention to and combat disinformation. It is our deepest pleasure and honor to pass it over to our moderator, Ms. Gibbs. Thank you, Tarina. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I'm I can't think of better timing to get this group of people together. We actually started talking about having a panel about the consequences of disinformation after um, the election. And obviously 
January 6th. And so I wanted to dive right in there. I think um, we thought that the f we were looking for bad actors or Macedonian teenagers or whatever we thought disinformation was or could do um, has so dramatically changed as we felt its consequences in the extraordinary aftermath. And watching a massive disinformation campaign around alleged election fraud being waged by leaders of one of our major parties. So um, I wanted to start there. And, and Kara, let me start mm -hmm. with you. If, if you had Hermione's magic time turner and could go back, what could we have done? What could democracy have done differently to protect itself with the press, the platforms, the information warriors against, right. against what happened? Well, a lot. I think one of the things that I'm trying to call up an article I wrote, which I, which I wrote in, in early 2019, where I actually said uh, very clearly, what if after if Trump loses, he lies about um, uh, the election fraud and continues to do so? So I think one of the things that that has been a problem for me and a lot of people in Silicon Valley or the disagreement we have um, is that they don't anticipate any consequences or pretend that they can't as if they aren't adults. And they are. Um, and so we tend to treat them as if they were, aren't able to imagine things that are going to happen. And, you know, if Kara can make it up and actually call it exactly what happened, which was. You know, I actually said um, my premise was to be to ask what Twitter management should do if Mr. Trump loses the 2020 election and tweets inaccurately the next day and for days after that, that there would be widespread fraud in the election. And moreover, that people should rise up in armed insurrection to keep him in office. This is my guess in 2019 from just watching it. And I think when I wrote that, I got a lot of pushback from Silicon Valley saying, that's ridiculous. It's not going to jump off the page. And of course it jumps off the page. I studied propaganda at the School of Foreign Service when I was a student. These things, the repetitiveness, all the, the signs were there. Besides that, these group, these companies have all this information about th what people are doing and how they're going from place to place and how they put stuff onto YouTube, say a, a, a YouTube video onto Facebook. They have all the connective tissue to understand uh, how people become radicalized. And so when I think about it, I, I, I try to find uh, empathy for everyone. I try to, I don't succeed most of the time, um, uh, but I try to find empathy for everyone. So I have a lot of empathy for the people who attack the Capitol. I have no sympathy for them. I think most, many of them should be jailed um, for doing what they did. They're adults. They walked into somewhere they shouldn't. They broke things. They knew they were, they were breaking the law. Um, and, and some of them were more malevolent than that. And so one of the things I worry about is that they actually, when you look at the pleadings, actually believe what they were doing was to save democracy. And so it, they somehow got radicalized. And if you look in all the pleadings, there's Facebook organization, there's Facebook radicalization, uh, there's YouTube. And so I just, I, I, they should have known. I don't know how else they knew and they should have known both at the same time. Well, you put your finger on something I want to, I'm interested in, in going further about the difference between the cynical manipulation of, of public opinion that you so astutely predicted a year ahead of time versus, as you say, the people who thought that they were doing the patriotic duty, it feels as though we're not dealing with what, however we think of mis and disinformation so much as theology mm -hmm. and, and how you, you combat that when you think of the consequences that we are seeing. The Ipsos poll this week has more than half of Republicans still thinking that the election was stolen, Biden's not a legitimate president. That's, that's, Democratic catastrophe on like a- Because it's persistently put out, this is how people get news and it's persistently mm -hmm. malevolently put on there constantly. And, and, and what happens is, uh, is, the, is it's amplified and weaponized by these social media uh, firms. It's like Clockwork Orange when they had his eyes, you know what I mean? Just like doing at him all the time. This is the result you're gonna get. And it's not even a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody what happened here. So Roger, Facebook's own review, internal review found that half of all vaccine hesitant content, the other, I think, great, you know, information challenge of the moment, we have the election, we have the pandemic, that half of all the vaccine testing content came from just 111 Facebook users, which tracks with the research we are finding at Shorenstein that you have this small group of super spreaders who are doing an enormous amount of the damage. Uh, and Roger, I know you've been thinking a lot about uh, how, why has no one been one willing or two able to stop this when we are seeing the consequences play out on the scale that they are? So, so Nancy, the thing that I find so troubling is that 
you know, when we, those of us who are trying to get Facebook to look at these problems early, when we went to them, initially they just gave us, you know, what I would describe as a public relations response. But when the pressure built after Cambridge Analytica, Facebook did an internal study that said that 64% of the time that a person joins an extremist Facebook group, say something like QAnon, they do so explicitly because Facebook recommended it. So we need to think about this issue where Facebook's business, which is advertising based, requires our attention. And if you take a, uh, the maximum aggressive approach to getting attention, you're going to bombard people with stuff that inflames them emotionally. You're gonna to try to trigger them. And you're gonna do it with hate speech, disinformation, conspiracy theories, because those trigger flight or fight. So we can't help but look. And if you think about this, Facebook built a business model that is about packaging groups of people into categories that can be sold. And it turns out that the more extreme categories are more valuable. And so there were all of these red lights starting, you know, with the US, well, really with Brexit in 2016, then the US election, then Myanmar, then, you know, the, the Brazilian election, the Christchurch uh, massacre, all these things are going on. And Facebook literally runs all the way through all of these red lights into 2020, when we discovered there are 3 million members of QAnon in Facebook groups and the largest Facebook pages devoted to QAnon. Which means Facebook, because 64% of those people joined those groups because of Facebook recommendation, that means Facebook radicalized 2 million people into QAnon. And then you follow that through. QAnon was the biggest amplifier of COVID disinformation. It was the heart and soul of Stop the Steal, and therefore the heart and soul of the insurrection. And Facebook radicalized the people and, and gave a platform for them to organize it. And you know, like Kara, I mean, this is, we can sit here and compare notes. Somebody put on Twitter the other day, a page of my book written in 2018, where I explained that if you allow this manipulation of people's emotions to go on long enough, it will eventually lead to an insurrection. And the part that really bothers me is the signals have been there, but our democracy is already badly worn down. And so our ability to respond is impaired. And these guys, because they control the environment which the conversation goes on, in which in theory, democratic deliberation is supposed to happen, they have the ability to choke that deliberation off. And that is exactly what they did. So, but, so Facebook's Nick Clegg just argued that it's actually, that Facebook is not polarizing and that it's not in their interest to radicalize uh, users and make people think that Tom Hanks is actually a cannibal. So at, at this point, I think we should take what Mr. Clegg says with a grain of salt, but let's be clear. The issue here is not polarization. And the notion that polarization is inherently bad, I think is wrong. I think the real issue here and the real problem that we're dealing with is that they breed extremism and they breed cults and they do it because doing those things is profitable. And so Facebook is really, they're like a magician. They know a lot about attention. They know a lot about people's perception. And so they're constantly doing the magician trick of getting you to focus on the left hand while they're doing something with the right. And with all due respect to Mr. Clegg and other people there, I do not accept the framing that they bring to that problem or frankly, any other part of this. And I would encourage everyone to approach everything they say with deep skepticism and this is a classic example where if you listen to Joan, and I don't know why Joan hasn't talked yet because she's the key to this. Go whole Joan, thing. hush Roger, go. <laughs> I'm, coming to, I'm coming to Joan. I know, Nancy knows my spiel on this, but lay a question on me. So <laughs> Professor Gibbs. Say, <laughs> Professor Gibbs, one of the things, that, the way you frame this that I find really helpful uh, is to think about the true cost of, <laughs> of this, the true cost of misinformation. And your analogy is to secondhand smoke. It's just a different way of thinking about the public costs porn. Can you walk us through that way of thinking about the damages we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's been really plaguing our field is, is assessments of who's really paying the price for all this free social media, uh, which is to say that the pro, you know, the old adage is, of course, if the product is free, the product is you. And 
you is not really the right frame here. The product is groups. The products is collective attention, collective action. And so when we're doing our research, we're not looking at individuals per se, but we're looking at, in a very social movements-y kind of way, how groups get mobilized, how groups understand the world around them, that is how they get information about the world, and then how do they make decisions about what to do. So for us, the, the research challenge is always one of uh, wires to the weeds. So what happens online? How does it show up in public space? And when we think about public space, and you know, Roger and Kara are going to be very familiar with this uh, early claim of social media that we're just the public square. We're just over here being the public park. Anybody can come in. And I'll tell you, if you show up to the public park at 2 a.m. with your band <laughs> and you want to play a show, no, it's not going to happen. If you show up at 8 p.m., it's not going to happen. If you show up at noon with a PA, it's not going to happen which is all to say that the public park even has rules. But one of the ways that we became enticed by uh, these social media platforms was because social movements had a first mover advantage. 2010, 2011, nobody really cared what was happening on Facebook. And it was only really when journalists showed up to Twitter in mass that we started to care what was going on on Twitter. And activists really showed what was possible on these, on these different platforms. And so as I thought a lot about this public um, square mentality, I thought about what are the rules that govern public space? And one of the most important rules we have and that has developed over time is this idea that you can't smoke in public space. And it doesn't show up because people are dying of, of lung cancer. It happens because insurance companies, epidemiologists, um, airlines, everyone is starting to figure out that secondhand smoke or being around people who smoke is causing market externalities. It's costing more to support the structure and the industry of smoking than it is to uh, regulate public space. And so the actual concept of secondhand smoke has to be invented before we can take legislative action on it. And so for me, the concept here is misinformation at scale. Now, I'm not interested that someone is wrong on the internet. That happens every night. And I'll tell you, I'm up at 2 a.m. fighting people who are wrong on the internet when I've got a gripe. I'm talking about when millions of people are being reached by the same message that causes such a public conversation, either on trending or it's reaching you know, hundreds of thousands of people through YouTube, that then public health officials have to start addressing it. When doctors started calling me during the pandemic and saying, Joan, I'm, I, I'm perplexed. Why do people think there are microchips in the vaccine? We don't even have vaccines. And I'm like, well, there's a YouTube video <laughs> from this weird guy who claims that the vaccines are, are the mark of the beast and they got microchips in them. And then if you do a little bit of Googling around vaccines and microchips and things, you start to find the rabbit hole. And so one of the things that our research has been really trying to do is get at these um, conspiracies, these network conspiracies, these misinformation campaigns that touch millions of people, and then work backwards from there to understand the actors, the behavior, the content, and the design of these systems. Because we cannot uh, ignore the fact that, like Roger and Kara have shown, is that it's the design of the system itself that is playing a really big role in how this uh, misinformation at scale is, is changing the nature of what it means to be in public. One of the things you were talking about secondhand smoke, I would link it more to opiates, just like opiates. Like who paid for opiates precisely? The American taxpayer. Who paid for the attack on the Capitol and the cleaning up? The American taxpayer. Who's paying, going to pay the price for a lot of this is going to be the American taxpayer. If you link, start to link it with money, uh, it really does get much more interesting. And, and one of the things that Facebook does really cleverly is that they're like, we're not the cause of it. No one's saying you're the total cause of it. The cause of it are the people who attack. The cause of it is Donald Trump for continuing to push push these lines. The cause of it, all the people around him that go up and down this this stack of cable news to down into Reddit, down into QAnon, except that the one guy in, in Sephora, Japan, the guy, the one guy who started apparently QAnon, he's the problem. But, you know, being, being a handmaiden to sedition is not a very particularly good look for Facebook or any of these social media companies. Um, and so, you know, that's where they try to get you. It's like, it's not our fault exactly. And you're sort of like, kind of, 
is too among the things that Joan well, well the first people to pay the price though for this has been journalism mm-hmm. think about your beat Kara I, I mean the tech the tech beat in 2014 2011 2012 was so much different mm-hmm. it was business it was innovation it was you know there were problems with surveillance you know but the tech beat after 2016 became content moderation right and that really I mean I am dealing with the wreckage of hundreds of journalists that have been tasked out with looking at hate, incitements, uh, violent conspiracies, because you don't get the sanitized version. You don't get the HBO version of QAnon without murder, animal torture, uh, pornography, ch- child pornography. You don't you don't get to erase that as a researcher and journalists are right now. This tech beat, this disinfo beat is incredibly broken. I mean, I am dealing with very fragile people who want to leave journalism forever just because of this broken because of what as with researchers of just the toll of having to spend their days looking at unbelievably gruesome disturbing content yeah and then to be able to tell the story and then when you get an impact story uh you someone tells you how they fell down this rabbit hole or how they got sucked in and all the family that have left them behind and how the struggle i mean you take on that, you know, journalists are incredibly empathetic people, even if you don't want to admit it. Um, and that's why great stories resonate. And but unfortunately, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been wa- it's like watching um, people coming back from being war correspondents and them trying to reckon with their lives now that uh, there's been a change um, in the administration and, and things are shifting. Um but they also will not relent. I mean, they, they do not believe that Donald Trump is gone forever. They are bracing for a second round of this. And if we don't get platform companies um, on the hook for cleaning up some of this mess, then I don't, I don't know how the tech beat is going to transform and, and survive it. And Kara has already mm-hmm. given him a name for his new platform, Trumpet, which... Yeah, I did. I wanted him to call, you know, I, I, I said, you know, mind space is probably not advisable given his history. And, uh, and then titter was of course one that I couldn't put in the New York times. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I was, uh, my, he's not doing a social network. He's too lazy and executionally incompetent. So that, that was besides, I mean, he'd like to get back on Facebook, which is going to be decided, I think this week or maybe the next, this week or next week. Um, and as usual, Facebook's going to drag us down another ridiculous argument about someone who broke the rules of Facebook dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of time and we're still discussing whether he should be allowed on it are you kidding me like really well, serious I'm glad you raised that because that that decision falls to the facebook oversight board uh mm-hmm. and it seems a little strange for a company to outsource its principles to an independent does. entity um yeah, but that's not what they did nancy so I what mean, is- so so it is a potemkin organization so let's think about the actual math there are billions of posts on facebook every day And if by some miracle Facebook gets so that they catch 99% of the problematic posts, which by the way, they're nowhere near that, particularly with hate speech, but let's say for last they got there, that still means you have tens of millions of problematic posts every day. So this, the uh, oversight board has been in business for two years. It has looked, I believe at a total of 12 decisions, like 11 of which were posts and the other is Trump. And I mean, they are not chartered to look at any of the business policies. They're not chartered to look at the architecture. This is really a complaint board that is designed to operate at the fifth or sixth decimal place relative to the scale of the problem. So you are the real Facebook oversight board. So tell me how that fits. The the real Facebook oversight board was literally something that Carol Codwallader put together uh, before the election because you know, there was Facebook, there was no counter to Facebook and the nonsense that they were putting out before the election. So it was literally just an emergency measure to just try to call attention to some of the big issues that were out there. There was no pretense that, you know, we were yeah, there, it's, 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 a, it's a prank kind of thing, but, you know, trying to poke at them in, in a way or get attention to the fact that this is just useless. I mean, on so many levels, it's completely useless. It is. It is, And the, fa- the notion that's independent is laughable because Facebook completely controls and coordinates every aspect of their communication. So, you know, the, the, the whole, the thing that's is- not Facebook- true. They do have independent, that's not entirely true. They're trying to pretend that they are independent. They are, they, they are independent in some way, but it's, it, it, I think the more of the point is 
they're not having their strings pulled necessarily. They don't need to pull their strings. It's it's an impossible task, is what it is. It right. to how Joan it's feels about it. Speaking of impossible tasks, it's okay. structured to look at things in a legal format. And the problems that we're dealing here are not strictly legal, okay? And so when you look at Donald Trump, you're going to sit there and default to some generalized First Amendment thing without looking at the much more important issue of the huge threat it poses to democracy and public health. So this is taking place at a school of government, and we're all about solutions. And we now are accustomed to seeing the CEOs get barbecued in front of Congress, although the questions maybe are improving a little. Barbecue? It's a nice barbecue. It's very light. Well, you know, sweet baby rays. Come on, Kara, you know the meme. There's, that, that's much tastier than what they do there. They take like a match nearby and or, or an incense candle and near Jack Dorsey and does whatever. At least this time they aren't asking. Uh, They're terrified to be there. Or how to fix an iPhone or something. But, uh, but, I'm curious. Yeah, can you get me a discount on my iCloud? <laughs> like, Actually, some that... of the questions are great. David Cicilline's stuff is great. That was a great hearing on both sides. Actually, it was pretty good, except for a few crazy loons. But we've seen every imaginable: break them up, tax them, sue them, regulate the harms, create best practices. Um, if you were sitting on any of those committees, what would you ask, and what would you recommend? Me, all of them. All of you. All of them, every one of them. I don't. There's two issues here at stake. There's no such thing as big tech. There are big tech companies, and they're all different, and they all have different issues. Amazon, Apple, very different. Apples are probably fixable in a much smaller way. Amazons are about marketplace and workplace issues right now. Actually, that's where they're where they're going to have their most their biggest challenge, which they're having right now in Alabama and elsewhere. Um, and you have Google, which is a clearly a monopoly issue here, and how they use their monopolies. With Facebook, it's an issue about moderation and 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 things like that. So there's lots of ways. Fines which they've tried, which they give them parking tickets, which they keep parking in the same spot over and over again. That's one way to do them. One is enforcement of current laws. That hasn't, they don't have the, the resources to do that. So fund the FTC, fund the Justice Department, fund other agencies to be able to enforce and to have the guts to enforce because they don't really can't go against a lot of these companies. There's more PR people working for Facebook than there are at the FTC, I think, in Washington. Um, so, or lawyers, forget it. Like they own all the lawyers, they own all the lobbyists, they own the, not just Facebook, but all of them. Um, and then you can do legislation on the state level and on the federal level, a federal privacy bill, a data bill, a, any, any federal bill, which there aren't any. Um, and then there's uh, two more things, which are um, uh, create, uh, uh, create a government agency that oversees information. That's a little more controversial, but that's been out there. People have thought about that, an FDA for information and algorithms and things like that. And then lastly, there's Section 230, a reform of Section 30 to 230 to bring in liability in some cases to this area. This is a an industry without liability. And that a monopoly, monopolist without liability, what could possibly go wrong in that situation? Um, powerful monopolist, the richest people on earth, the richest companies on earth, no liability. Liability, I like lawyers in this case. I, I think it's probably a good idea to let lawyers let loose on these companies a little bit. Roger, what do you think comes out of So, so I, I look at this as we have both problems that have existed in the past, you know, anti-competitive behavior, and then we have new problems that, are, that were created by the nature of internet platforms, which are just unlike anything we've ever seen before. But fortunately, there are analogies. In the history of the United States, in the 1870s, we created building codes because the building trades were building cities that were essentially fire pits. And in the 1890s, we passed something to make railroads safe that required air brakes and couplers. In uh, the early 20th century made the food and drug industry safe. In the 1910s, we banned child labor, which was the core of the business model of the, uh, of the garment industry. In the 60s, we, we banned the dumping of toxic substances by the chemical industry. So we have faced core industries which have been harming public health before. And I think when Kara talks about liability, that's key. So issue one is safety. This is an industry where not just on the internet, but throughout tech, the business practices are unsafe. So we need to have a code of conduct for all computer scientists and other engineers who work in these companies that basically says, you know, Hippocratic oath, I will do no harm. I will 
make every effort humanly possible to anticipate harm and mitigate it before I ship a product. And then there are penalties for failing to do that at the individual level, at the executive level, and especially at the corporate level. But everybody has to have some level of liability. And it's way bigger than 230. 230 is just about platforms. But the same issue, I mean, think about facial recognition and all the problems that have taken place there. Think about algorithmic bias and all the problems that are going on there. 230 doesn't fix any of that. So we have to look at it more broadly. The second issue is the right of self-determination, which is one of the founding elements of our country. And the issue here is surveillance capitalism. And the question that Shoshana Zuboff raises is, explain to me why surveillance capitalism isn't as unethical as child labor. Why is taking the autonomy of people away from them by manipulating their worldview. Remember, the 10,000 people who stormed the Capitol were convinced, despite masses of evidence, that the election was wrongfully decided. They were manipulated to that position. They're not stupid people, but people profited from creating this information bubble that they were sucked into. And so I think you need to do something there. I personally would ban all third party uses of the most intimate data. So health data, location data, browser history, there's a long list. And then I would have opt-in privacy for everything else and where you get to control how your stuff is used. Recognizing that as Joan said earlier, the problem isn't between the platform and you, it's the platform and all of us. It's my data being used against a zillion other people and your data being used against me. And then lastly, you have competition, which is where uh, antitrust law comes in. And the key thing is antitrust doesn't fix anything, but it buys time. And my top recommendation is for the Department of Justice to federalize the Texas AG's antitrust case, which is a price fixing case against Google and by extension, Facebook. And the reason that matters is that in October of last year, the DOJ sentenced the CEO of Bumblebee Tuna to more than three years in prison for price fixing with Starkist and a whole bunch of financial executives for three plus years in prison for a price fixing. Those cases were literally 1% as big as what Google and Facebook did. And I believe that we need to not only federalize it, but pursue as DOJ sometimes does a criminal case against the executives for consciously doing this. Because if what Texas alleges is true, the executives actually planned this. And there's apparently proof. And so when I look at this, I think we have to recognize that our democracy and our right to self-determination are under attack. And we're either going to use all the tools available to us or we're going to lose democracy. And that's the debate we need to be having right now. Um, Joan, if, 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 if Congress and regulators and the Justice Department did everything Roger just recommended uh, and fixed brokenness of our public square. You've talked about what, uh, what we need to replace it, what, what an, a public interest internet would look like and what it could do. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I just wanna echo that I agree with all, like using all the tools in our toolkit because ultimately the way that disinformation travels and how uh, impactful it's been on our society is related to the way in which these products are designed, which is they're designed for openness and scale. And when things are designed in that way, um, essentially it is really easy to pull off grifts, scams, hoaxes, any of the like, right? And so if the business model is openness and scale, I will guarantee you everything open will be exploited. And this is what our research has shown at the with the media manipulation casebook is that last, Last year, um, our boy, Steve Bannon, right, who people had kind of thought was a ghost and had thought, oh, isn't it funny he got caught showboating on the yacht and got arrested for the build the wall scheme where he embezzled a million dollars. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, you know, and we've got a couple of other chicken littles on the call here, so I don't feel so bad saying. Um, but, you know, we were tracking and saying, you know, Steve Bannon's behind COVID as a bioweapon. Why don't you pay attention to this YouTube? Uh, he's going on twice a day telling people that COVID is a bioweapon. He's flown in a whistleblower. He's behind the Hunter Biden laptop showing up at the New York Post. That day he goes live with Giuliani on YouTube saying, I don't know where this laptop came from, but it sure does have a lot of crimes on it, right? I mean, we're not idiots. And then of course, Steve Bannon's um, 
was right at the center of the idea that the Dominion uh, voting machines were <laughs> communist algorithms were flipping the ballots, right? He's at the center of three of the biggest disinfo campaigns. And all of you have to do is turn the history page back just a little bit to 2016. Who do you find at the center of Cambridge Analytica? Yeah. Who do you find at the center of the alt-right? You find Bannon and Breitbart. And before Breitbart died, Breitbart and Bannon got together and made a movie called Occupy Unmasked. And they were students of Occupy. They were students of internet mobilization. Absolutely. Bring, they tell uh, you, they tell you they, how they did it too. They love to brag about it. They're like, oh, yeah. say, Mr. Bond, now I'm going to take this saw and we're going to cut you up in half. And then we're going to, they're literally like James Bond villains. They're like, Oh, it is first so blatant. This, then, we and, this, then we use this, like with Brad Parcell, who seems to go off the reservation every now and then for very, yeah, and you watch it play out and you listen, right? All you have to do is listen to what they're saying. And it's all the whole game plan. There's no, Russian playbook. I'm sorry. Like you just got to watch a YouTube video or listen to Steve Bannon's podcast. I bring that all up to say it doesn't need to be built this way. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, it's all on top of our very stable, but needs a little fixing internet infrastructure where we used to struggle with access. We struggled with the digital divide. We still do. It's not necessarily rural versus urban anymore. We see uh, uh, class and poverty playing a huge role in who gets access to the internet. We got to fix that. But if we talk about a public interest internet, we actually have to talk about the deep structures, the deep part of the infrastructure. We have to ensure that everybody has access. We have to ensure that everybody has machines. And this is where, um, and Kara, thank you for talking about this in one of your podcasts uh, recently. If, if Facebook gets into hardware, it's going to be bad. Because yeah. then it's going to own the zone. L LG. Hang on, yeah. if we get into cryptocurrency. So they're trying well, to- I mean, social banking, you know, let's take a pause on the play when it comes to the currency argument, because that's another one that'll destabilize um, okay. any and all countries, not just the, the ones that, you they're know, people call developing. You know, if you're a sovereign nation, you have control of the legitimate use of force and currency. If you have a Facebook backed, uh, reserve currency, which is what they're trying to do. And it's, and it's hardwired to your phone. Go so on. At that point, all wealth moves into that system and out of the banking system. And so suddenly it's not taxed. It's not traceable. There's total loss of control. And, you know, the, 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 the key point here, there's something Joan said that I really want to pick up on, which is this notion of speed and scale. So if you, if you study the philosophy of Google and Facebook, these folks are engineers through and through, which is to say their value pyramid has efficiency at the top block. Now think about the United States. Our value pyramid has democracy and self-determination in the top block. What's the difference? Well, democracy and self-determination are inefficient by design. We need time and a space for deliberation in order to have both self-determination and democracy. But these guys, because of speed and scale and the focus on efficiency, in fact, are a threat because there's no way for, for democracy to move as quickly as what they do. Because in their mind, democracy and self-determination are actually, they can take those things away and make the world more efficient, therefore create more wealth. And I look at this, and so rather than viewing them in a good, bad mode, just recognize that these are competing value systems. And the conversation we should be having is, do we want to have democracy and self-determination? Or would we prefer to have corporate authoritarianism that looks sort of like China, but run by corporations? And you know, maybe people would prefer the Google Facebook model, but we ought to have a real conversation because if we don't do anything, they're just eating us to death. And, you know, we don't have the ability. In the, in the phone area, which with Jones, that's very important. Facebook failed with its first phone because it was a crappy phone. Um, and, and, and Apple is so good at it. But look who's been trying to pull back on the privacy stuff. Apple with its transparency efforts. That's, and who got attacked today by Peter Thiel, Facebook board member, as being a woke company in cahoots with China over cryptocurrency. Whenever he points to something, I'm like, oh, he's talking about himself, right? Like it's, He's one of these Spock chess guys who thinks he's 
being stuck just when you can actually see him do it in like the trick as he's doing it. But when, it, you know, if uh, the attacks on Apple are going to accelerate right now and that that's what the Trump administration was, start, was gearing up to do because Apple's in their way. Apple's directly in their way. And, and so is Tim Cook. And he's quite, uh, listen, Apple's not perfect on lots of issues, but you're going to see a lot of attacks on Apple because of this thing coming in the next three weeks, which you can opt out of Facebook, your app, if people do it. Yeah, I thought your interview about that as a you know, bullet to the heart of Facebook's business model. And he's like, I don't think about Facebook. <laughs> you know, people, about should Facebook. Have, people should have this kind of Control. Well, that's that's what's at stake is what I'm telling you about this um, notion of a public interest Internet, which is to say that I think, um, you know, some of the representatives in Congress that are starting to walk through what a Glass-Steagall type act for the, the Internet and tech industry might look like. They have to look at the tech stack very seriously and say, if you're in hardware, maybe you can't be in the app store because there are two points at which you could choke out any kind of competition. Mm -hmm. exactly. We have to think about where the public interest lies. And, you know, frankly, like many of us are users of social media, but the actual customers of social media are advertising companies. And so they're going to have a lot of leverage and a lot of, um, you know, sway in terms of positioning how social media companies make money uh, as regulation starts to come down. But for me, I, it's important as an academic and as a researcher to hold on to this notion that the web should be decentralized, that we should have multiple access points to it. We shouldn't have one really good search engine and a bunch that are pretty terrible or sometimes good at different things. But we also need to have public access points to the internet and to search and to social media. And which is to say that I, I like some of the, the regulations around data portability, but I'm also incredibly mindful that the future of our internet as we started to, to go off on crypto, um, the future of the internet is, uh, you know, is, is terrible uh, if we do not uh, intervene at this point in order to uh, basically decentralize it. I mean, right now you have several companies that own almost all of the access points and almost all of the ways in which you install software. And, and it's not going to be pretty as uh, a few other uh, organizations get involved that might be playing cloak and dagger. You know, they might be in, in running with Facebook or they might be in running with some of these techno libertarians, but they're not who they say they are. And, and this is the disinfo field that I'm talking about, which is that there are people creeping into this field saying, hey, I know a lot about disinformation. I know a lot about the Internet. And they're not who they say they are. And we've got to be really careful as we go forward with regulation uh, that we're listening to people who've been um, at this a little while. I want to bring the students into this conversation. Um, and our first is from Amy, who's a student at Harvard College. Amy, over to you. Hi, thank you all for being here. This is a super important issue and it's really interesting to hear your thoughts on the topic. Um, so as we're trying to deal with existing technologies, um, other technologies are also rising, such as the ability to do deep fakes um, and make more convincing lies um, and make it harder to sort of establish a ground truth. So how do you think that at least technologies will affect disinformation and how much harder it is to basically convince people of the truth? Well, it's that's it's it's even worse. I mean, one of the things I always say, you know, Mussolini didn't need Instagram. Hitler did not need Facebook, right? Or or Twitter or whatever. You don't need these tools. They use newsreels in those cases. Different people use radio. Hitler used radio a lot. There's lots of ways to manipulate people in propaganda. These give them extra special tools to do so by making putting putting all facts at in question. This is not new. This is not fresh. This is just more effective and harder to discern, especially as everyone. And what you have to do is you have to understand the systemic nature of it. It's addictive too, by the way. It's necessary for your job. Everything about it's interesting. These, you know, whatever you think of the vaccine with the chip in it, it sure is interesting. Like that's that's creative. Like, you know, when I look at some of these conspiracy theory, I'm like, cool, like, but not cool, like uncool. Um, but there, you know, it's hard to fight against, you know, just put on your mask. Well, no, masks are about, you know, there was one thing going on online where Biden is actually an AI robot. And the reason he wears a mask is because the mouth isn't finished. Literally, someone said that to me. And I was like, 
that makes sense. Like, what are you talking about? So it's just, it's just gives them more tools to confuse and confound us. And when you see how good it starts to get, even for a second, if it's allowed, even if it's cleared up rather quickly, it's super hard to, to know what the truth is and not. And that's the whole point of this is to confuse you as to the uh, post fact, make a fo- post fact world. And so it, it's convincing you to see what you see, what you believe and not believe what you see. I think that's really the whole goal of the whole thing. So that's a really good at, uh, way to look at it. I wrote a paper um, with Britt Paris about uh, cheap fakes and deep fakes, which is to say that it doesn't even need to look that good or that real. I mean, you're watching a lot of this stuff on a tiny screen with really uh, bad sound. And so it doesn't even need to be that deep and that um, convincing in order to just kind of stick in like a brain worm. Um, and the hard part about the cheap fakes argument, of course, is that everything can be edited online, right? And so we saw during the election a few different, uh, speed up a video, slow down a video, you know, slow down Pelosi. And she sounds like she just got, you know, out of the liquor store and me too, right? Like if you do that to me, I'm going to sound like that too. But, um, Where the responsibility lies in terms of telling you that the account that you're looking at is who they say they are, the context around it is really important so that you don't think that you're getting news from the AP, but it's just someone who has spoofed their logo and and, and cloaked their account. They do it with the Times. They do it with other people. Yeah, I mean, the New York Times, I'm not going to lie. I mean, the April Fool's just around the corner, you know, (laughs) like people prank things and, and but I think one thing we could also pay attention to in this moment is Daniel Citron's work about hate crimes in cyberspace, because it's not the big political hoaxes that I really care about. It's the way in which is this is going to be used to harm young women and to put them into very precarious situations. And then it will be used to blackmail them and to, and to get them to do things that they probably wouldn't do otherwise. And so uh, as we think about this, I always want us to remind ourselves to think about the everyday use case in which you know, a teenager is going to encounter this technology and all of the horrible things we've done to one another. Um, And so with the deep fakes conversation, I never want to um, forget that the the number one use case of deep fakes, 96% of it online is pornography and uh, non-consensual as a matter of fact. And so that's what's important and that's what's at stake here is not the big political scandal that might happen because of them, but the everyday uses and bullying. But Nancy, can I add one thing? Because I think Kara and, and Joan set up something very important to think about, which is why is it possible to do this at so much scale today? Why is there so much more of this than there was under Hitler? Why is there so much more of this than there was 20 years ago? So there are two things going on, I think. One is that Facebook in particular, it, it, the way it does its sorting essentially is tailor-made for creating cults and conspiracy theories. But we also live in a time where there's been no accountability. So think about genuine conspiracies. So 2008, the banking industry conspired to destroy the US economy through irresponsible trading, and there were no consequences, right? Boeing, first it had the 737 MAX, then it had the 777 jet engines. The CEO leaves with like $70 million payout, no consequences. So you live in an environment where on the one hand, you've got somebody who's in the business of creating cults. And on the other hand, you've got all these actual real conspiracies that took place without any accountability. And you put those two things together. And I think that that sets up what Kara and Joan just said. Uh, Thank you for that. Our next, because I want to get to as many students as we can, uh, is Sophie from the University of Chicago. Thank you. Hello. I was just curious where you guys think we can draw the line between misinformation and the constitutional right to free speech is the only difference scale in that you're influencing lots of people. Uh, the First Amendment doesn't apply to Facebook. I, I wish people would get that into their brains. It, it's a it's a private it's a private company. If you have a restaurant and people vomit in your soup, you can kick them out. Like they can do whatever they want. So p- people have they've given them this idea that people can say anything they want in these platforms, and they just can't. 
and they they have rules and they apply them. Their issue is their enforcement is so crazy. Like you never know what they're going to do. Um, and they've given people the false sense that they're uh, they're defenders of the First Amendment, which it, there's no such thing. They're protected by the First Amendment, by the way, in that government can't do anything about a lot of this stuff. And so uh, and they're protected by Section 230. So I, I, they, they whenever whenever Mark Zucker starts talking about the First Amendment, I want to cry because it's it's the first one and it's a real short one. And I figure he should be able to read it properly. And it doesn't he, he tends to twist it in ways that aren't true. Either he doesn't have a good understanding of it or he's using it cynically, which he's not a, a particularly cynical person, I would I would say. Uh, but uh, it, it, First Amendment has nothing it has almost has much less to do with this than one would imagine. Um, I think I think people should be able to express themselves any way they want. But when people start to say, like to, uh, what Tom Cotton, it was Tom, which who was the one? Tom Cotton, whoever got his yeah, book. Yeah. Oh, Josh Hawley. Yeah. Oh my God, I've been censured with the face. I'm like, he never shuts up. He has so many platforms. He can go on the floor of the Senate. He can go here. He can go there. It's just people don't like him for his assholeitude, and he's going to pay the consequences for it. And then he screams First Amendment. That is what's being used persistently around fake news cancel culture and and woke like the same thing they're just they're just abusing words like woke what's the opposite of woke asleep is that okay i'd rather be woke right like it's just it's so ridiculous what's being done manipulatively in the name of the, the poor first amendment which is wonderful which is a wonderful thing so i wonder I think, I think what sophie may be partly getting at is everyone from you know bernie sanders to angela merkel has <laughs> not loved the fact that Jack Dorsey can decide one day Indeed. he's going to, you know, kick anyone, including the president. Because it's the one platform and they think it's the most important, but it's there, by the way, there's lots of platforms. It's just the one platform everybody's on. So it's still a private company really in lots of ways. Angela Merkel's problem I issue is she said, why don't you just pass a law then, you know, forbidding him? Like they can do that in Germany because they don't have the first amendment here. They can't do that. Like they can't, you can't, they can do what they want. I don't know what else to say. There's a private company. They can do what they want. I'm troubled by the fact that two people made a decision about something. Uh, even if they made a decision I happen to like and I think was for the good of the people, just two people. Maybe we should have more companies. Maybe we should have more outlets, That's competition. Uh, next up is Xander at uh, University of Chicago. Hi, um, thanks everyone. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, I'm a second year at Chicago. Um, I guess I just want to ask a question. Um, I think like it's easy to blame the internet because it's the new thing, right? We see a lot of all the bad where maybe in prior media we haven't. Like what is maybe like the role of social distrust, right? Like misinformation tends to concentrate among particular kinds of people who are antisocial and prone to conspiratorial thinking. Like is is it is it maybe like social distrust or is it is it just just the medium like is it maybe are there background things of income inequality and stuff like that that are also influencing like the impact of of like QAnon which only like five to six percent of the U.S. population believe like is it is it misinformation or is it like these background social problems with our society? Joan knows so, everything. About this. Yeah, I know a lot yeah. about this. You can see me like itching in my chair to answer you, Xander, because I'm like I'm stretching my back out because. It's it's not just so I'm a child, you know, of uh, a punk rock generation, right? Like I was raised on uh, Black Flag and Rage Against the Machine and and I don't trust the government and I'm not afraid to say that. And I think it's good not to trust the government. I think it's good not to trust people in power because people in power have different motives than people who don't have power and people who don't have power tend to have to group together in order to get power. But if I can pretend to be a group of people <laughs> and I'm not those people, right? Like what we saw Russia do in 2016, where they pretended to be at least a hundred different social movements. And I can steal that legitimacy. I can steal that voice and be pro-Muslim, anti-Muslim, pro-patriot, anti-patriot. I can pretend to be Black Lives Matter at the same time that I'm pretending to be white supremacist. Um, that's not normal, nor should that be acceptable uh, in terms of the way in which our information ecosystem works. Uh, but nevertheless, that is how uh, Russia and I, that is just the the tip of the top of the ice cube on the iceberg of people who pretend to be something that they're not online. I mean, we've all seen the movie Catfish. We've seen the TV show. It's it's 
it's systemic. Brands are doing it. Politicians are doing it. Governments are doing it. Artists are doing it. And because of the way in which we don't have very legitimate ways of understanding how information gets to us, it's not that we distrust it. It's that we fall into this situation where we see it a lot. So social media is incredibly repetitive. That's what liking, retweeting, sharing, that's a repetition. So the more you see a message, the more you're going to start to believe it. The second thing is redundancy. So you see it on Facebook, but then you pop over to Instagram and you see the same thing. That's part of the system, friends, actually. And then your friends say it and then cable says it and it shoots up and down. And the, re- and the redundancy matters because then psychologically you start to remember it. Then social media does something that no other technology does is it responds to you. That is, you make a post and people comment on it. And when you go to one of these QAnon groups and you're just like, hey, I'm just a guy from Chicago. What do I need to know about QAnon for? And they're like, actually, there's dungeons in Chicago where the Democrats are keeping babies that they're going to harvest their you know, adrenochrome from. And you're like, what? In Chicago? Where? Right? So the responsiveness is key here because no other platform does that or no other media system does that. And then reinforcement. Those are the actual names of the algorithms. Reinforcement is an incredibly important mechanism because that's why you end up seeing it after you've maybe like, you don't like QAnon, you're like, forget about it. And then you go to the next uh, YouTube video and there's four other QAnon videos queued up because you watched half of one and they're like, well, maybe you're thirsty for more. And the algorithms then set you up to see the same thing. Same thing. I almost said shit. Same shit happens with like when you Google like buying a mattress or things you only need to buy once. You see that follow you around the the internet, right? That's reinforcement. And then the last piece of it, which is what we call the rabbit hole, is once you start exploring and you start searching for these things across platform, you start following accounts, that's when you're in the rabbit hole because you're in a subculture then where there's a different norms, there's different language, there's a whole community there. And and then you're a white supremacist. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have, to have that dire. My mom, when the election happened, said Biden won the election. I get it. She's a Trump, she's a, or whatever, whatever. Uh, Biden won the election. Four, three and a half weeks later, it was stolen. It was, and I was like, what? How did you, you know, she was completely logical. And it was stolen. It was absolutely stolen. I was like, how, how, where did you come to that conclusion? It was the same thing with COVID. It's the flu forever. And then it wasn't. And now it's the flu again. Trust me, it just, it's really pernicious and it can be just that light. It doesn't have to, you don't have to go spend your time wearing a t-shirt and scream at people, you know, at a, or, or attack the Capitol. It's much more pernicious and small in lots of ways to create distrust. That's what it does. We have time for one last question and that's going to come from Ajay from the college. Hi, um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation so far. Uh, so, um, yeah, my question is just about Section 230 and some of the proposals to reform it. Um, I know that they've come up at various points throughout this conversation. Um, and obviously, we have sort of like the really unclear um, Republican proposals that are focused um, on, you know, um, sort of policing neutrality um, on um and, and, and uh, you know, grounded in this supposition that uh, conservatives are being discriminated against on social media. But there are also more bipartisan policies that are focused on patrolling more criminal content um, on um, social media platforms. And I, I think we can agree that, you know, that might be a good thing, but there are also necessary consequences to that, such as, for example, uh, less privacy for users of these platforms. Um, or, you know, um, compromising some of the encryption. And so my question to y'all is like, how would you balance Section 230 reforms with, you know, concerns about privacy or making sure that the um, internet remains a forum for free discourse? Roger, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so so the one thing I would say here is we really need to recognize Joan's point that the issues here are structural. And that moderation as a concept is almost certainly doomed to failure uh, at the scale and pace that these things operate at. You really have to change the structure of what they do. And the question is how best to do that. And section 230 is about changing the incentives. It's about saying, look, 
you you cannot just run this business without any consequences under any circumstances. The problem here is th that surveillance capitalism, which is the business model of Google, Facebook, and many others, has now metastasized beyond internet platforms into other categories. So you right. see it in AI, you see it in facial recognition, you see it in a lot of smart devices, so 5G stuff. And in that context, we need to think about liability more broadly. And so to me, 230 is where Facebook and Google want the concentration to focus because whatever we pass will essentially go after symptoms rather than the root causes. And that will favor them relative to competitors. We should try to resist that impulse and go after the actual issue, which is saying that you are personally, professionally, and corporately responsible right. for, for any time that you fail to anticipate and mitigate harm on shipping a product. And you know, we the problem here is if you look at Facebook, how they got away with 2016, maybe you say, okay, they didn't see it coming, we'll give them a pass for screwing up the UK and the US presidential elections. But how about after Myanmar, right? How about after Brazil? How about after uh, you know Sri Lanka? How about after uh, Vietnam and, and uh, the Philippines? And- Roger, you, know, you forgot Beacon. Well, this is my point. Okay, this stuff is because you don't know what Beacon is, but go look it up. It doesn't matter. Same thing. Is, they, they've been doing this since Mark stole the photographs at Harvard. Okay, and and this thing that they can apologize, promise to do better, and then go back to business as usual—that yeah. is the problem. And so, please don't get so focused on the specifics of something like two thirty that we miss the larger issues. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you, all of you. Obviously, I, I could happily listen to all of you debate these questions all night, but this was really, really valuable, especially at this moment. Um, and thank you to the University of Chicago as well. Let me um, turn this back to Mark Guerin of the Harvard IOP. Well, thank you, Nancy and Joan and Roger and Carr for that really important and fascinating conversation. We were thrilled to collaborate with the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, and I Thank Tarina and Lucy for their very fine introduction as well. We invite you to join us at two upcoming JFK Junior Forums tomorrow, one o'clock. We will welcome back to Harvard Amanda Nguyen from the class of 13, who is the CEO and founder of RISE. She'll be in conversation with Weijia Zhang, the CBS uh, senior White House correspondent, on the to important topic of protecting the civil rights of the AAPI community after the extraordinary rise in hate and harassment of that uh, important and diverse uh, community. So we hope you join us tomorrow at uh, one o'clock for that next week on April 12th, celebration and ob observance of Arab American History Month. We'll look at the topic of the future uh, of Arab American public service. And welcome to the forum, former Congresswoman and Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala and Colorado State Rep, Aman Joday, being joined in conversation with two of our students who will be uh, moderating the conversation, Anand Havaz, a junior, and Lena Lofgren, who's a sophomore. So we invite you to both of those. I end, Nancy, with my thanks for this great collaboration with the Shorenstein Center and our colleagues at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and especially to Kara and Roger and to Joan for, for a most interesting and important conversation. Thank you all and good night. See you on the internet.